All right, here we are uh, in the middle of a sermon series on giving up control of our lives. <laughs> Why in the world would we want to do that? <laughs> well, just look at how well we've been in charge, right? <laughs> you know, and it's actually not so much about giving up control as it is about giving up the illusion of control, because really that's the truth of it. There's there's really so so little that we control about our lives. None of us is really in control. We just want to imagine that we are. But what if we could surrender what control that we think we have to God? What would that look like? What if we were to seek first his kingdom, his reign over us, his rule in our lives, his calling the shots uh, day by day in our lives. What if we truly related to Jesus as Lord over our lives instead of just as some additive to our lives? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, we kind of treat Jesus as though he were a protein drink to help us recover from a workout, you know, kind of refuel, rebuild, rehydrate, you know. Need a little something extra. Sometimes we, we may treat him like an energy drink, you know, like a five-hour energy or Red Bull or Monster. You know, I need a little, a little tired, and I, I need a little pick-me-up pick here, Jesus. And for, for some of uh, folks that are a little older here, <laughs> maybe uh, we treat Jesus like uh, he's a little Geritol for iron poor blood <laughs> or STP for that engine that's running a little sluggish. You know what I'm talking about? But what if we invited Jesus to take dominion over our lives? I had a sense that Jesus didn't die on the cross to be a little pick-me-up for us, to be an additive to our life. Jesus died to redeem and to heal our broken past. He died to set us free from our own self-destructive tendencies. He died to empower us to live a life at a level far beyond anything we've ever lived before. He died to become our life. What if we related to Jesus as though he were life itself? Because he is. (laughs) right? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What if we related to him as though we really believed that? So anyway, our our series has been on control, and, and in the series on control, we focus on a particular aspect of letting go and giving God control, and that's been in the area of our finances. Okay, this is not some shakedown (laughs) for BCC. You know, just squeeze a little more cash out of the congregation. But it's been about finances because that tends to be the area in our life where we get most anxious about being in control. It seems like money is life and life is money. And if, you know, James talks about if we could control the tongue... (laughs) <laughs> we'd be perfect <laughs> if we could just do that. But if we could let go of control of finances to God, I, I, I think that's almost the same thing as controlling the time, letting go of control to God. So anyway, two weeks ago, Scotty reminded us that we'll never really let go of the control of our lives until we believe two things. And the first one was that we believe that God loves us. It is ready to care for us. You know, you, you just never let go of control until you believe that. And the other thing was to, to come to believe that in following Jesus, we're no longer owners, but stewards of what we have in our hand as, as people who have pledged ourselves to follow Jesus. So anyway, we looked at that, and then last week we looked at how being generous This being generous is a profoundly concrete way of relinquishing control 
where we began to, add, because we've experienced God's goodness and grace in our life, we began to pass that on to other people. We began to demonstrate that same grace to others. And man, it really, really feels good. Well, my assignment for today's message is on tithing. Oh, my goodness. Well, it says control still. Uh, they'll fix that somehow. I know they will. <laughs> but my, my sermon is on tithing. Yeah, tithing. And please notice that Scotty is not here this morning. <laughs> Scotty says, you get tithing, and I'm out of town. <laughs> KV skipped town, too. You know, they leave me here to manage this, to muddle through this all on my own. Thanks a lot, Scotty. <laughs> well, actually, I, it's, it's like I'm pleased. Tithing has been a special blessing in our life. I get it, though. I really get it that tithing is a touchy subject, and, and that some pastors... Preach it in such a way that you walk away laden with guilt or frustration or suspicion or anger <laughs> or any number of those other emotions. And that's the last thing that we want to have in here at BCC. So here's the deal. Tithing. Is it obligation or is it opportunity? I want us to think about that this morning. You know, I realize that some people... Uh, to teach tithing as obligation, duty, law. It's kind of like, if I'm going to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, <laughs> I got to pay my taxes. You know, it's just like, that's just part of it. You got to do it. You know, you don't like it, but you got to do it because you're a kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom. And hey, after all, tithing's cheaper than Uncle Sam. You know, tithing's only 10%. And Uncle Sam, he really gets greedy. Well, I'm really, I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see it in that way. But, you know, some people can get real picky about it. I had a guy one time, we were, which somehow the subject of income tax returns came up. He's telling me, oh, you need to tithe your, your income tax return. I said, what? <laughs> that's, that's not income. I mean, that, that was income, and I, I gave it to the federal government, and I gave them too much, and they gave me some back. Oh, well, that's income. You need to tie that. And I said, when you give a, for a $5 hot dog, you give a guy a $20 bill, and he gives you $15 back, do you tie it on the $15 that he gives you back? <laughs> you know, come on. Well, no, but you know, anyway, I mean, some people get real picky about it. But this idea of obligation. And then some people see obligation in another way. And, and this one kind of scares me. They see tithing as a way that obligates God then to somehow bless me. Kind of, you know, I do this, God has to do this, he's forced it. I feel really, really uncomfortable with that. So what I want us to do is consider tithing not as an obligation, but as an opportunity, uh, a delight uh, a grateful response. Um, if I'm going to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, tithing is a way of expressing my appreciation to be included in that. Uh, furthermore, for me at least, tithing means giving over that part of my world to God's management. And I guarantee you, God is a much better manager than I am, okay? <laughs> but is that legit? Is, is that a legitimate way to look at it? Is it biblical to see tithing as an opportunity rather than an obligation? So, you know, I'm, I'm the Bible teacher on staff. I, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that teaches at Howard Payne. So let's do a biblical survey of tithing, okay? We'll just do it that, that way, you know. Uh, the first two mentions of tithing in the Bible are in Genesis, Abraham and Jacob. Jacob, also known as Israel, uh, we'll remember that in a minute. But in Genesis 14, 20, Abraham gives a tithe to Melchizedek. Now, th the background is this. God has called this man, Abraham, into a personal relationship with him, has called him to leave family, country, kindred, leave everything familiar, and walk with him in Cana 
And, and Abraham has responded to that call. Abraham has, as it were, kind of gathered all his stuff, and he's moved his, all his chips to the middle of the table, and he's all in with God, trusting God. The immediate context here in chapter 14 is uh, th- there's some you know, bad guys in the, in the region, uh, five kings that take it on themselves to go down into this region and capture four little city states that are there and, and cart the populations of the people back to where they are back up in uh, northern Syria and uh, included in the folks that they captured and took off as slaves were Abraham's nephew, Lot, and Lot's family. So Abraham hears about it. He gets a couple of friends of his in the neighborhood, and they go and pursue, and they defeat those five kings and set his uh, nephew and his family free and all the peoples that were there as well. And in that particular situation, this guy named Melchizedek shows up. Now, Melchizedek, king of Salem, but he's high priest of the most high God. That's Abraham's God. And he shows up here in this setting, which has just kind of put a target on, on Abraham's back, <laughs> you know, kind of flying under the radar until this time. He shows up. He, he demonstrates himself as a power in the neighborhood to be dealt with. He's put a target on his back, but God sends Melchizedek to affirm Abraham and to bless Abraham. And Abraham then tithes. His, his giving a tent to Melchizedek is just a spontaneous sense of thank you, God, for being a part of my life, for being involved. This is my, my sense of how I respond to you in a spontaneous sort of way to say thank you for what you've done. There's no obligation here, no law, anything like that involved in this. It's just his way of spontaneously expressing his gratitude to God. Then the next time we see tithing in the Bible is Genesis 28. This is where Jacob promises to tithe. Now, he, he's a jerk. He, he's, he's a cheat. And, and his conniving has caused him to have to run away from home. And he's... he's you know, running away from home, he's out in the middle of nowhere, lays down at night, and in the middle of the night, God comes to him in a, in a dream, and there in that dream, God promises to be with him and to bless him. And the covenant that God had made with Abraham, his grandfather, and Isaac, his father, God extends that covenant to Jacob and promises that he will make him and his descendants a blessing to the whole world. So Jacob wakes up in the morning, recognizes that he'd been sleeping on God's front porch, names the place Bethel, which means house of God. (laughs) Oh man, I didn't know this was God's house. (laughs) Names it house of God. And then Jacob vows that if God will do everything that he's promised, (laughs) that Jacob will two things, worship him and two, Jacob will tithe. (laughs) You know, it's kind of like even a jerk gets it, right? (laughs) But this spontaneous, I I, I think, inspired something by a grandfather, maybe, by a father, maybe. Maybe this is a pattern that he's seen in in the family, which is a beautiful thing, if if that's part of our family heritage. But uh, he, he promises to tithe. Then we don't see anything about tithing for another 400 years in the Old Testament. We don't see it again. 400 years later uh, in, in Leviticus, Numbers, in Deuteronomy. So Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, has 12 sons who become 12 tribes. The family then becomes a clan. The clan then moves to, God transfers them to Egypt uh, by means of Joseph. And there in Egypt, this clan grows to a mighty, mighty nation. And over time, They're a threat to Pharaoh in Egypt, and he decides he needs to do something about that. So he enslaves the people. He's trying to cut down their numbers, something, a genocide of at least the males uh, of the Hebrew children. And this is where God sends Moses to uh, rescue the people and bring them out of Egypt to take them through the wilderness back to Canaan where they will function as God's people God's unique people 
planted by God at the crossroads of the ancient Near East to be the image-bearing people of God there, where they will will then, uh, at, at the crossroads of the ancient Near East, where they will bear his image to the world, where they will, through the instructions that God gives it, embody a love to the poor, the helpless, the outcast, the alien. <laughs> they will, will create a society like none other in the ancient Near East, that demonstrate the character of God, and they will be a blessing to the world there. And at Sinai, God gives them, we call it the law. The Hebrew word is Torah, and I get the idea of law. I get that, but, but the word basically means instructions. <laughs> How do we be the image-bearing people of God at the crossroads of the ancient Near East? God says, here's the instructions. <laughs> And in those instructions, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we have tithing there. But it's interesting that as God gives those instructions, pardon me, let me catch up with myself here. There's basically two purposes that are expressed for, for tithing there. One is a very practical purpose that provided support for the Levites, one of those 12 tribes, who were to minister both the worship of God to the people, first in the tabernacle, later on in the temple, but also the word of God. These were the folks that were supposed to be spread out throughout the nation. And when people want to know, well, what does this look like? What's, what are God's requirements here? What, what it, how do we live this out in our life as the image-bearing people of God at the crossroads of the ancient Near East? The Levites, their job was to teach that law and, and when you weren't sure, you go to a Levite and get a ruling on what the law said. But <clears throat> there was that practical function, and then there was a spiritual function that is stated in Deuteronomy 20, uh, 14, 22, and 23, that it was so that they could learn as a people to honor and reverence God. So even when tithing is giving in the context of obligation, and I, I would say in the Old Testament context, it had that. Its purpose was practical on the one hand and very spiritual on the other. <clears throat> well, anyway, we don't hear about, um, <clears throat> pardon me, we don't hear about uh, tithing again until Second Chronicles. It's a time of revival uh, during Hezekiah's day. Uh, the folks had, had forgotten God. The temple was dust and bird droppings. Uh, the, the doors to the temple didn't even work. They had to take the doors down and refurbish the doors and put them back because nobody was going to church anymore. But they, they had a revival. They had a renewal of, of, of the sense of God's presence with them and people responding to that. And in a time of great joy described in chapter 30, they come in chapter 31 to, to renew their commitment to tithing. Because it's like, hey, this is what we do when we're acknowledging God at work in our midst. We heard about it again in Nehemiah. Pardon me. I've got that up there. We hear about it. Ooh. Here we go. I'm learning how to use my thing here. We hear about it again in Nehemiah 10. And again, it's one of those cases where the people have kind of fallen off and, and, and the people have been unfaithful. Uh, in their worship, unfaithful in their, their sense of caring at all about being the image-bearing people of God at the crossroads of the ancient Near East. But, but Nehemiah comes, and there's this renewal of interest. They rebuild the, the walls of the city of Jerusalem in less than two months, and they're sensing, you know, God's with us. He's blessing us. How do we respond to that? They start tithing again <laughs> happily <laughs> as part of their celebration. Sadly, the last instance in the Old Testament that we have of tithing is in Malachi 3. And this is one of those low times for Israel again. And uh, folks have turned self-centered. And so the prophet comes and says, well, a man robbed God. And they say, how do you mean robbing God? And he says, well, you're holding back the tithe. So that last mention in the Old Testament, obligation appears, but it's it's an indication that there's something wrong with the heart to begin with. 
The issue is not so much tithing as the heart in its appreciation and response to God. So that's Old Testament. What is the New Testament? What's its witness to tithing? Well, (laughs) precious little. Did you know that? Only one time, really, that tithing is mentioned there. We'll get to that in a minute. You know, some people you say, well, you know, no, one explanation for tithing not being part of the New Testament is, well, you know, these were Hebrew people. They had an expectation. So the earliest followers of Jesus, they just went over from their, their old covenant giving to new covenant giving. They just moved into that spontaneously. And, and while that may have been true of people, Jewish, predominantly Jewish Christian churches in Palestine, I don't think that was true of, at all in Paul's churches out in the larger Greco-Roman world where they were predominantly Gentiles with no history of tithing or anything like that. And yet, the only place in the New Testament we hear of tithing, one place, and it's where Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees, and he has this to say. Uh, we, we find it in Matthew 23, 23, but there's a parallel passage there in Luke. But Jesus says, you tithe the mint, the cumin, and the deal, your, the leaves from your herb garden, okay? That's being pretty picky. <laughs> you go out in your herb garden, and you pick the leaves, and, you know, nine here, one here. <laughs> you tithe the deal, the, the mint, the cumin, and the deal, but you leave out justice, caring for people in an equitable way, you know, being a voice for the powerless you know, to, to be the champion of the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the alien. Um, he says, you leave out justice. You leave out mercy. You leave out faithfulness. These are the things that you ought to have done, Jesus says. And not left the other undone. Tithing. I mean, these are Pharisees that Jesus is talking to. These are people who are responsible to teach the instructions <laughs> for that old covenant. <laughs> And Jesus says you shouldn't have left the other out. And it was appropriate for Pharisees to do that. But we're on the other side of that covenant. We're people of a new covenant. And what we discover is that when Jesus and Paul talk about giving for the new covenant people of God who are following Jesus as Lord of life, they never mention tithing, ever. Uh, you, you can check it out if you want to, but take my word for it. Okay. Um, what Jesus stresses is generosity. Give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure. Press down. <laughs> Squeeze it in there tight. <laughs> Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. Running over. It will be put back into your lap, for with the measure that you use that is for other people, that measure will be measured back to you. Wow. Paul does the same. He says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. He says, each one of you must give as he's decided in his heart. This is a freedom issue. How we give is a freedom issue. Now, I I want to talk about what how we give reveals something about us. But it's a freedom issue. It's it's not to be given reluctantly or under compulsion, where the preacher comes in and he really twists the screws. You know, that's when you need to back off. (laughs) If you're feeling pressured by the preacher to do something, just kind of back off the way and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? (laughs) Okay, don't, don't, don't let the preacher talk you into it. You let the Holy Spirit be the one that guides you there. He said, God loves a cheerful giver. Oh, man, I, if I had time for stories, I could tell you times where I was something less than a cheerful giver, and God loved me anyway <laughs> because that's who he is. But God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. 
Paul goes on a couple of verses later. He said, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So, when I read the New Testament, the New Covenant, for the new people of God who follow the Messiah Jesus, this is not an obligation. There's no sense in which there's this rule that we owe God a tenth and we should pay up. What I find instead is that life and all that it entails is a gift of God's grace and generosity. So this is what I think God would say. And I feel pretty sure about this, but this may be a little scary when you see it, okay? I think God would say, you owe me nothing. Just let that sink in a little bit. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, I understand that that gift presents a profound opportunity to respond. Wow. Given something like that. But I don't think that God intends for that gift to make us feel like, oh, I owe I owe, I owe, it's off to work I go. I don't think it's that at all. Now, I I recognize from Scripture that there are some gifts that God gives that do obligate us, okay? If I have been granted mercy, then I need to be merciful to others. Now, notice, God says, you don't know me anything. But I do want you to take this mercy that I've given you, and I want you to share it with other people. If I have been forgiven, then I do need to forgive others. Again, God, you don't owe me anything. I've forgiven you freely. But I do want to see you respond in forgiving others. If God refused to judge and condemn me, I should refuse to judge and condemn others. <laughs> and the bottom line is, I am blessed in order for me to be a blessing. It's what God said to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I'm going to make you a nation that will be a blessing. I will bless the whole world through you. And it's, it was Israel's failure to understand that being the chosen people of God is chosen to be a blessing to others. It just didn't quite get that. But as New Covenant followers of Jesus Messiah, we need to get this. If we make him Lord, we, we need to get this. Now, again, from God's perspective, you owe me nothing. But on the other hand, from my perspective... The way I look at it for me, because God has given me so much, man, I I just feel like I owe so much to him. And and I think that's a healthy attitude of gratitude. You know, God doesn't give me things to make me feel obligated. But if I can receive his gifts, his grace, and feel no sense of wanting to reciprocate in some way, I think that would reveal that something wrong with my heart. A heart that can be blessed and choose not to bless others. Something wrong with that heart. To have no longing to give something back to Jesus in light of his goodness. Can I be bold enough to say that's utterly selfish? And that would reveal an unmitigated self-centeredness on my part that would border on the sinister. Let me just say that. So God says, you don't owe me anything, but 
I look at that and say, I feel like I I need to there 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 I, I need to find a way to respond to that kind of giving. That's appropriate response to that. And that's where tithing for me is this opportunity to give back. Um, It makes the difference. Paul said it like this. He said, the love of Christ controls us. Well, Paul, are you saying the love that Jesus has for you controls you? Or are you saying the love that you have for Jesus controls you? And Paul would probably say, yeah. (laughs) It's his love for me and my love in response back to him. There's something about that that just kind of gets a hold of my life. Paul says, we concluded this, that one has died for all. Jesus died for us. Therefore, all died, and he died for all. Paul would say that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So I see tithing, giving tithing is not an obligation from God, but an opportunity for me um, to acknowledge my sense of his ownership over my life. You know, he died for me. He redeemed me. I, I, I need to respond to that in some way to demonstrate my appreciation. So I give a tithe back in gratitude for all that he's done for me and in me. I I give him a significant piece of my life, which represents the whole. Here's the piece that represents the whole of my life that I want to give back to him. But I see in that this opportunity for me to relinquish my sense of need to be in control of my own life. So, For me, part of that is me trusting his care over my life. I'm going to respond in this way, and I'm going to trust you to look after me. Part of it is me surrendering to his management over my life, particularly in my finances. And and in the end, that becomes kind of self-centered on my part because I found that he does a better job than I ever do. Anyway, it's, it's about giving God freedom. By, by me tithing, it's giving him freedom to rearrange things according to his priorities in my life. That gets a little scary, right? Well, let's look at this. It's about welcoming him into an area of my life that I no longer want to worry about. You, you want to keep on worrying about finances in your life? <laughs> you know, the older I get... You know, life, things cost more. I'm retired. Me and Uncle Sam have that, you know, SSI check, you know, that comes in, and it seems like it gets smaller and smaller. (laughs) Do I want to worry about all of that? I really don't want to. There's something about saying, God, you're in control of this. I'm going to trust you with this. I don't want to worry about it anymore. And this is a way that I put you in charge of that in my life. It's about experiencing the outcome of his blessing rather than just the outcome of my own careful planning. <laughs> my own careful planning. I, I, I can remember, I, it was a few years ago, uh, we got a little extra. I forget where we got a little extra from, but we got a little extra to house. I thought, oh, I'll invest this in the market. And like three months later, it, you know, that that crash somewhere after 9-11, but the next big crash, you know, that crash hit. And $2,000 suddenly became like $1,200. And then I remember it grew up again almost to about 1800 bucks, And then another one was crash. It kept, you know, uh, my careful planning. My careful, do I want my finances to exhibit my careful planning? 
Or do I want my finances to something to know something of God's blessing on them? I think I'm going <laughs> to go with God's blessing. I'm sorry. I'm going to go with that here. Uh, but I understand tithing is not always an easy choice. But I can affirm it's a blessed one, okay? Man, oh, man. I'm looking at my time and realize i got to hustle here. But Diane and I were newlyweds at seminary in the early 70s. We both had part-time jobs on campus, just over the minimum wage. Finances were tight. Buying groceries required a shopping list and a calculator to make sure we had enough money for what was in our basket. Early on, we had to save up two weeks to buy a broom. Got there and needed a broom. It cost more than what we had, so we had to wait the second week to buy the broom. So, you know, things are getting scary. Diane says to me, I think we need a budget. <laughs> it's like, a, I don't know that a budget's going to help, but yeah, let's do one. <laughs> so anyway, we, we, together we made $480 a month. Part-time jobs, less than minimum, uh, you know, just above minimum wage. I think I got two thirteen an hour and she might have got two twenty five an hour because she was in charge of people and I was in charge of a broom, okay? I was janitor on campus. But anyway, we, we sat down, income 480 a month, and, and bare bones budget, if we tithed, it was going to be 540. If we didn't tithe, it was going to be 586. We were making 480. Pardon me, not 5, 486. Tithe 540. If we didn't tithe 486, we were making 480. And Diane looked at that, and she said to me, she said, do you think, we, you know, can, can we tithe? Can we afford to tithe? I looked at it. I said, Diane, if we tithe, we've got to trust God for 60 bucks. If we don't tithe, we have to trust him for six bucks. We've got to have to trust God anyway. I just soon tithe. <laughs> if you're trusting, right? You know, like, go all in. And so we made a commitment to do that, and God took care of us. But just so you know, trusting God for $60 isn't just sitting at home waiting for the check to come in, okay? A few days later, I get a call from Rodney, my neighbor. He says, what are you doing Saturday? I said, I'm flexible. What's up? And Rodney says, well, the manager of the apartment where I work wants the shoreline cleaned up. It was right on the San Francisco Bay. Wants the shoreline cleaned up. He's willing to pay extra for someone to help me. I'm not sure what he's going to pay, but he's not stingy. I said, okay. So I showed up on Saturday with Rodney, and we worked four hours to clean things up. <clears throat> Manager comes up, looks it over, and it's like, wow, guys, you did such a fantastic job. I've never seen it look so nice. He said, I know that we never talked about money, but does 15 bucks an hour sound good to you guys? Well, now, first of all, 15 bucks an hour in 1979 was big, big money. But not only that, I mean, yeah, yeah, that sounds great, you know. But I did the math. Four hours, 15 bucks an hour, 60 bucks. And I saw that as God's provision for us. I want you to know God is trustworthy. You might have to get off your butt for God to bless you, but he is trustworthy to take care of us. So did our tithing earn God's blessing? Oh my goodness, no. If, if you think what you do earns what God does, you don't understand what God does. Because what God does is always so much greater and so beyond anything that that we could imagine. And in and, and, and that, I'm not talking so much about finances necessarily as I'm talking about life, the things that really matter in life, where you sense God's hand on things and you realize it's because somehow you gave God control over that. Letting go is one of the hardest things to do. But when we can finally let go, and, and, and at our house, tithing has just been one of those practical things that we can do to let go. So, 
ah, using both hands here, this is dangerous. Tithing was that practical opportunity to surrender God's control over a life. So anyway, Scotty gave his advice. What have I done here? Oh, I got to back up. How do, alrighty. So this is Bill's advice. Got it? Scotty's advice, this is Bill's advice. Start somewhere giving God a regular portion of your income. And you know what I found out? I found out at, at BCC that's really handy. You, you get that QR code in the back of the thing, and it'll take you to a page where it says giving, <laughs> and you can click on that. <laughs> and I got to admit this. There's this place where you can set it up as a reoccurring gift. I didn't do that. You know why? Because <laughs> I wanted to be in control. <laughs> getting ready for the sermon, it was like, I better go and just set that up as a reoccurring <laughs> gift. <laughs> okay, God. <laughs> I gave up control. It's hard. <laughs> but make it from the beginning of the pay period and not from the end. And, you know, I, at our house, we get this and that here pieces at so many times of the month, it really doesn't matter. But if it matters at your house, I, I, my point here is don't give God leftovers. Give him first fruits. Okay. And then be as cheerful as you can. <laughs> Again, you know, I, my first, my very first experience of, of giving, it was like, well, there, God, I hope you're happy now. <laughs> and he blessed anyway, because that's who God is. Be as cheerful as you can. And then watch for God's blessing. And when you see it, tell somebody about it that God is faithful. Let's pray. Father, we want, uh, more than anything, we want Jesus to be Lord of our lives. And we just find it hard to <laughs> let go in so many ways. But help us to know what it's like to seek first your kingdom and then to have all these things added unto us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.